We are in Romans 8 tonight. So last night I, um, I did the announcements and I told people, we're going to do this study tonight and you must come, it's going to change your life. So someone told me, you, uh, someone's got to change my life tonight, I came tonight. So well, you know what, it's not me, I don't change your life, it's the Word of God. When we spend time in the Word of God, when we are reading these things and spending time in His Word, it becomes alive and it changes our lives if we take hold of these things. So we're in Romans 8 this evening and the title of my message is, We Are More Than Conquerors. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your wonderful word that breathes life into us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come and you take this Logos word and you make it rhema. You make it alive in our lives. And as it comes alive, that it changes and transforms us. And Lord, in times when we are in trouble and struggling and in times when we're in anxiety, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you remind us that we are more than conquerors. And as we study this tonight, I pray that these truths will, be, will become a strong foundation of faith in our hearts. And we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we've been in Romans for a while, and it's one of the most powerful books in the New Testament. And Romans 8 is one of the cornerstone, capstone um, chapters of the book of Romans. Just a wonderful thing to study. And in chapter 8, it's all about victory. But in these verses, Paul then continues to say, and he says, you are more than conquerors through him who loved you. Now see, you become a conqueror when you understand and take hold of a few things. Firstly, as we've seen, that you understand that you are in Christ. He's your Lord and Savior, and you are planted in him, part of him. Then when you understand what God has done for you in Christ, and when you understand that, how you respond to that truth in faith, then it becomes something that you can hold on to through every storm. Storms will be there. But if you're anchored in the truth, you can hold on. And then by loving him in response to his greatness and the things that he has done in your life. That is how I become a conqueror. When I understand what Christ has done, I take hold of it and I praise him for it. When I start to agree with Christ, with God, about what he has done for me. So Paul has been building up through this whole, um, to this whole thing through the previous chapters. He said that you were born in Adam, you were born in sin, and you have this flesh, and you will die with it as well. But during this process, you can be victorious. Because God has given His Spirit to us to transform us and change our hearts and our minds. See, this is the key. You cannot be victorious until you are victorious in your mind. There's a well-known book written very long ago. It said, The Battlefield of the Mind. See, what's the difference between two people who experience exactly the same thing? You can have a person experiencing a situation and he steps over it and goes on victoriously. Another person receives that same situation and it breaks him. What's the difference? It's what's here. That's what makes the difference. What do you think? You need to transform your mind. Take hold of that. Otherwise, you will be defeated. Now, the Bible says, how do we change our minds? Faith comes by hearing. There we go. And hearing by the word of Christ, Paul says. In other words, when you hear the truth, the truth can set you free. It's so frustrating sometimes when I speak to people and I can see what God has for them. I can see in their lives. And, but when you speak to them, they don't, they don't believe it. And they're stuck in that mode of, oh, well, this is who I am. This is where I am. No, you can be victorious if you take hold of it in faith. See, when you hear the words of Christ, you can defeat the doubts. You can defeat the fear. And you can defeat the lies of the enemy and the lies of this world. For example, you remember in Romans um, 8.28, we said, all things work together for good for those who are called, who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. All things. Now, if you know this truth, 
and you have the faith to take hold of it and stand on it, then you look for it. You will watch for it. When something bad happens, it will not arrest you into that space. When something bad happens, you say, I wonder what God's going to do now. I wonder what God is going to perform through this now. You are looking for the beauty out of the ashes because you've taken hold of it. But if you don't believe it, all you will have is ashes. There's no hope. See, you need to take it in faith. See, we can be more than a conqueror. What is the opposite of being a conqueror? It's living a life of defeat. What does your life look like? Do you feel like you're living a life of defeat? Moment by moment? Or do you have the mindset to know that God said that you are more than a conqueror? See, it is not God's plan that you will live a life of defeat. It's his plan that you will live as a conqueror. Now, what does that mean? This word conqueror, the phrase is a translation from Greek. And it's a word that we can understand the meaning without many difficulty. It means hyper Nike. Now, that is the word that the word Nike comes from. Conqueror, winner. And God says, you are more than a conqueror. Next time you see that swash, you say, yes, I'm more than a Nike. I'm a hyper Nike. More than a conqueror. See, it's not just victory. It is surpassing victory that God has for us. So let's, let's read this. I'm excited about this thing. Let's go into verse uh, 31. Romans 8, 31. By the way, if you don't have your Bible here, on the app you can go on the right-hand side, click on Bible, it's set up for you, and the notes is also um, on the sermon notes there. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him, with Jesus, freely give us all things? He says he's already given you Jesus, the most important person, entity in the world. How will he not give you all other things as well? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. God bless his wonderful word. The first thing we need is to be convinced that God is for you. Too many people think that God is against them. God is for you. If you take hold of this truth, if you write it on your heart and then live according to it, you will be more than a conqueror. See, if God is for you, Paul says, who can be against you? Now, there are many things and many people that may be against you. But Paul's point is this, that if God is for you, none of those things can defeat you. I love the, the, the example Paul gave us. You remember when we went through Acts, all the adversities he went through. They stoned him. He stood up and he dusted it off and he went on. They wanted to kill him in this city. He said, well, then I go to the next city. He didn't go sit in ash and say, well, I'm done now. Everybody love, hates me. I'm going to eat some worms. <laughs> no. Nobody loves me. No. 
He said, other people don't define me. I am more than a conqueror in Christ. In other words, the fact that God is for you, listen to this, has greater significance than anything that is against you. If you weigh it up in eternity, nothing can weigh up against God's being for you. No weight of any people, any person's anger or frustration or enemy can, can, can balance out God's worth. And this is the rock on which we stand. See, God is for you. And He has the final say in an eternal context. We need to stand back. When we look at this chapter, we need to stand back and look at eternity. And see, in the context of eternity, God has the final say. Your identity, who you are, and your hope is already secure in Christ Jesus in the heavens. And this is why you are not defined by those who are against you in this temporal world. You are defined by what God says. You're not defined by your experiences in this world. You're defined in what God says. Nothing on earth can compare against what God says about you. And then he goes on and he says, how do we know this? He says, because God proves his love for you. He proves that he loves you. Look at the extent that he went to to redeem you. He delivered up his only begotten son so that you might have eternal life. And see, this is the convincing evidence. When people go through suffering, experience hard things, living in a broken and evil world, they often see That has evidence that God is not for them. I'm going through tough things. How can God be for me? But that is the wrong mindset. They only need to look at the great price that was paid for their lives. God himself. It's the only, price, uh, the, the only entity that was enough to buy us back. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, if God did not spare his own son, how will he then yet also give you all the other things as well? Now, if you don't understand the heart of God, and this is one of the things people say about God, they say you can look at the scripture from a viewpoint that the father begrudgingly sent his son. And that Jesus reluctantly came. And that after he has done that, God now says to you, I have done my part, you, you better not mess up again. Get in line, sort yourself out, or I'm coming for you. See, that is the way that people see God. And you know what? This might be the human response. If you have to reluctantly run into a, a burning building to go and rescue someone, And then you put him down and say, listen, you don't put fire to your house again. I'm not going to do this again. Reluctantly. If the goal is to save the person in that moment just from that thing, that might be the mindset. But God had a bigger plan in store. See, it says in Hebrews 12 too, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Who, who for the joy set before him. What was that joy? It was not about in the moment dying on the cross and just forgiving sin. It is more. Ephesians 2.16 tells us this, 18 and 19. This was said before him, that he might reconcile them both, and he's talking about Jew and Gentile, in one body to God through the cross. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. That was the joy that Jesus saw in front of him. 
He said that he would buy us back, restore us into relationship, restore us into the household of God, so that one day when we're in heaven, it will be Jesus, and there would be the image of God everywhere, millions of people being in fellowship, loving God. That was God's aim. There's too much love in God that he wanted to stay in his own entity. He said, let us make those in our image. Why? Because it would exponentially increase God's image in more of his offspring. We are called the sons and daughters of God. Jesus being our eldest brother. So God's heart is that he would have the biggest family. Because he loves us so much. That's the joy Say before Jesus, to restore, to take back what the enemy stole, that which is God's, so that we can be restored in relationship with him. And this is for every person that believes in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes, let's praise God for that. See, the cross was the starting point. It wasn't the end. When you come to Jesus, you say, Jesus, here's my life. It's not the end. It is the starting point where we grow into that which God has for us. Where God does this continual work in us because his thoughts towards us is good. Psalm 23, 1 and 6 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Surely goodness. We sang it tonight. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. There's a translation that says God's goodness and God's loving kindness will hunt you down. It's running after you. God is in pursuit to be good to you and to show his loving kindness to you. It will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's heart towards us is good. You know what? Some in the world look at God and they have this skewed perspective. They say God is this eternal prankster. They call him this. They don't see the true character of God. Foolishly talking about God as someone that's trying to catch them out. Trying to do, to say, ah, I said I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do something else. And I'm going to just flip your life out a bit. They think they need to run from God because God is not for them. Jesus spoke of this. Matthew 7, verse 9 and 11. What man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Ha ha. Gotcha. Or if he asks for a fish, he will give him a snake. Will he? No good father will do that. He said, Then you, if you being evil, You know how to give good things and good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Now, of course, he's our daddy father. He's our Abba father. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he will give you everything you want. And I'm not just talking about blessings. Sometimes we go through things that are difficult and we say, God, I don't want this. Please take this away from me. And then it continues. And then people lose faith and they say, there is no God. But they do not understand that God knows what is good for you. That which you see as a curse might be a blessing that God is using. And it's hard to experience that. It's not easy to go through difficult things. I know. See, God doesn't spoil his children. He transforms his children. A good father knows when to say yes and when to say no. His purpose is to make you like his son. We so easily sing, more of you and less of me. Take everything. I remember my dad, I love him to bits, and he, he, he grew up in a pastor's house, and then he went off the road a little bit. And then when he was roughly in his 40s, he really radically came back to Jesus. And he said, Lord, just everything. I give everything. You know what? Five years later, he said, 
We should think before we say those words. <laughs> Because God hears. Went through tough things. But you know what? When you look back, you say, God knew best. If you say, God, here's my life, He will take your life and He will transform it into what He wants it to be because it is the best version of you that is possible. So don't let it put you off. It is a challenge to say, Lord, I trust you because in the end, I know that you are good. You know better. It might not be fun. I know when people train for stuff. I mean, my son plays basketball and sometimes they go on these camps and, and they train and their tongue, tongues are on the ground and like sore and everything. It's horrible. Nobody loves the training, but we need to get fit in the kingdom of God. God is making us fit. He's building our spiritual muscles. He's building our faith muscles. Hold on to God. Here's the beautiful thing. You're a conqueror because no one can bring a charge against you. God is for you and he is the one who justifies you. Justify can be said justified, never sin. Justified, never sinned. Justified. Jesus justifies you. See, the power of God being for you means that no one can bring a charge against you. There's no one who can condemn you. We saw that in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, the righteousness that God gave you as a gift far surpasses any charge that could be brought against you. You have the very righteousness of Christ imputed to you. Who is that that will bring a charge against you? Who wants to do that? The Bible says it's the enemy. Calls the enemy the accuser of the brethren. But there is no condemnation that will stick. He comes before the Father and says, I condemn him. As far as, mm, nope. See, he cannot bring a condemnation against you before the Father. But he would very much like you to join in his condemnation. You know who condemns you? You yourself. That's what people do. The enemy start to whisper in your ear and say, you're a real loser. You're not going to make it. You're never going to conquer this problem. You're always going to struggle with this. Do you really think that God will put up with you? Do you really think he will forgive you again? And you start to agree with him. And people feel unworthy and guilty and ashamed. And instead of running to God, they run away. Here's the thing. If you're convinced, and this is a psychological thing, If you're convinced that you are unworthy and unlovable and you're not standing on the truth, you will act unworthy. You will act unlovable. And it will attract people to you that want to mistreat you as if you're unworthy and unlovable. We see this devastating cycle in people's lives. Being people, you sometimes look at people and say, but... Why are they attracted to that type of person all the time? A person trying to destroy them. They go from the one man to the other or the one girl to the other or the one position to the other. That just destroys them. Why? I remember my dad was a policeman as well. And they say one of the problems that police have is domestic violence. Sometimes when they show up at the house for domestic violence, the person that they're trying to save start to attack them. So leave that man alone. Say, so, but he's hurting you. Leave him alone. They would take him away and that person would come bail that thing out of the jail. Why? Because it's the worth that she sees in herself. And see, this is on a physical level, but it's also in a spiritual aspect, in the spiritual realm. What you believe about yourself has a direct impact on your life. And God can change how you see your life by speaking his truth over you. See, if God is the one who justifies you, even you yourself do not have the right to condemn yourself. Who do you think you are to say I'm not worthy when God says you are? Are you God? No, you're not. Well, then listen to God. He says you are worthy. See, if we can only understand 
that God knows of every skeleton in the closet, every shameful thing we've done, and yet His love never fails. He's calling us to come and bear it all before Him, surrender it so we can experience His loving forgiveness as He cleanses us and changes us. And then Paul goes on to say, and he says, Christ is interceding for you. Now God is for you so much as we saw that he did not spare his own son. Christ Jesus who died and who was raised, who sits at the right hand of God. Then he says, who also intercedes for us. In other words, we saw um, two weeks ago, the Holy Spirit with groanings are interceding for us. The Spirit of God living in us. Groanings deeper for, than words. But not only that, Christ himself is also interceding on our behalf. Can you imagine that? Jesus asking the Father on your behalf. He is your advocate. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. What does intercession mean? It means to intervene, to stand in the gap. Imagine the scene in heaven. The enemy comes to bring a charge against you, telling God how bad you are. But Jesus is there interceding. What does that mean? He says, Father, we have seen this from the beginning. When I died on the cross, I already saw the sin that they were going to commit even before they were born. And I paid for it willingly. None of this is a surprise. It's not as if the enemy can come before the father and the father says, what? What did he do? I cannot believe it. Jesus, do you know this? No, Jesus says, we've seen this from the beginning. Before he or she was born, we knew. And we still chose to pay the sacrifice. It has been dealt with. It's been paid for. The accusation is fruitless. And the father says, not guilty. Amen. Amen. How great is our God. See, but you need to be convinced of God's love. See, one of the most important keys to being victorious, being more than a conqueror, is being convinced in the deepest part of your soul that God loves you. And there's nothing that can separate you from his love. See, what defines you as being a conqueror is not defined by if you win or lose here on earth by the world's standards. We are measured by the scales of eternity. And in that aspect, you're already more than a conqueror because of the free gift of life Jesus has given you. More than a conqueror. Death has been defeated. See, if God is your Abba Father, then you must absolutely trust His love that will never fail, no matter what happens in this life. Nothing can separate you from that love. God demonstrated it by sending Christ to the, to the cross. And Jesus demonstrated to willingly come. And then he says, earlier in this chapter we read, that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We all have this testimony in our hearts. And I'm convinced that it demonstrates that love through the course of our lives in many ways. I've said it before, but part of um, understanding unconditional love is when you get kids. When that little two-week-old screaming little thing pound the flesh, (laughs) all it does is make a mess and eat and cry, yet you love it dearly with all your heart. Because you can see your image in that child. God has made that child for a purpose. And you love that child unconditionally before he or she even did anything. And that's just a fraction of what God feels for us. 
I can remember many times when I was alone with God. Especially in times of worship. And that's why I love worship. That's why I, I drink in worship. How oh, they were revelations of the love of God. When he moved over my heart. In times of, of feeling rejected and feeling self-doubt. Feeling not good enough. When he whispers in your heart. When the words that you sing suddenly becomes alive. When the words that you read on this, on, in this book suddenly jumps off the page. And it changes you from the inside out. Changing you from being someone that feels like a Gideon. I'm not worthy God. To God saying, I'm seeing something else, mighty warrior. You cannot yet see what I see, but I see something more. There's more. So you don't have to be insecure. You can be secure. But you're not secure in yourself. You're not self-sufficient. You're sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Because of what he has done. And then Paul nails this in. He says, nothing can separate us. Nothing. See, earlier in this chapter, Paul spoke of the suffering of this present life. But here he gives the clear examples of the things we can relate to. Tribulation. And I tell you, we are in tribulation. Maybe not in the flesh, but in the spirit. There's an oppression in the spiritual realm wanting to oppress the children of God. Wanting to draw people away to the things of this world. We always think the tribulation must be someone with a gun standing against your head. That would be a very clear sign. Now the subtle thing is we are experiencing tribulation in the spirit. These attacks against our hearts. Persecution of the faith. He goes on, if you struggle, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. It's a hard life. And Jesus said, in this world you will have many troubles. But take courage, I have overcome the world. See, take courage means to have greater faith. To trust that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Because that's the first accusation the enemy brings. He says, if God really loved you, this would not be happening. He wants to separate you from the love of God. That's why we need to anchor it in it. Nothing can separate you. John 10, 28 says, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one can pry open the, the fingers of our God. No one is strong enough. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. See, from a, from a wider perspective, what if worse come to worst and you lose your life? Then you're still in the Father's hand. That's our eternal hope. See, but the question in many people's minds, however, is why God in His great love doesn't keep us from all the troubles? For many, it seems inconsistent. You say you love me, yet I go through trouble and trials and difficulties. They're convinced that a God that is good should not allow evil to exist. And there is a place like that. We call it heaven. But on this earth, where God has made man with a free will to freely choose to follow God or reject him, these choices people make have great impact. Jesus gave this parable. He said, That the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. The wheat and the tares will grow up together until the harvest. See, the worker said, should we go pull out the tares? And he said, no, because you might pluck some of the wheat as well. He says, till the end. And then they will be separated. We live in a world where there is wheat And tears. It's part of where we are. See, God did not promise to keep us from trouble, but He did promise to be with us in the trouble. And believing that, taking hold of that, makes you more than a conqueror. Hebrews 13:5 says, He Himself has said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. 
I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? It seems flippant to say this, but the worst thing that man can do to you is send you to heaven. When you lose your life on this earth, you have a security in heaven, in eternity. God is with us even on the journey until there. And then also lastly, faith is our victory. In all these things, Paul said, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. But notice that faith works together with love. He said, I am convinced. See, that is the key. Faith is the key. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes this world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Holding on to the love of God. Many people feel defeated in this love, their life. They feel beaten up by the troubles and struggles that come with living in this evil world. Many people live discouraged. What is the difference between a person who is defeated and a person who is more than a conqueror? Faith. It's what you believe. Some have faith that's easily shipwrecked. They become angry and bitter because they don't believe that God can bring beauty out of the ashes. They're not watching for the help that God will provide. See, God wants us to have a faith that perseveres in the storm. I love the line of that worship song that says, My anchor holds within the veil. What does that mean? See, the veil was the space that was, it was the place in the Holy of Holies where people were not allowed to enter into. There was a veil, but their hope was in God behind the veil. So now it says, my anchor, my strength, that which I hold on to is in that which I cannot see. I'm anchored in the love of Jesus. Hebrews 6, 18 and 19 says, We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope you have is an anchor of the soul, sure and fast. Now this hope, in the English word hope, I said this last Sunday morning as well, English word hope means, I don't know. Maybe it's going to snow Friday. I don't know. Weather says so, we'll see. What about in six months on my birthday? I don't know. What's the weather going to be? I don't know. I hope it's going to be nice. But see, it's a different word when we speak from the Bible. That word means I have a steadfast, secure hope, a strong hope. I know my Lord. How can you overwhelmingly conquer through such difficult things? Because your faith is sure and steadfast. And not only are you not defeated, you have peace that passes all understanding, because God is for me. See, faith is anchored in truth. God loves you. He's your Abba Father. That is a truth. That's an anchor you can hold on to. Then he says, we will not be separated from Christ. The reason we cannot be separated from the love of God by angels or demons, past things, future things, high depth or anything, is because we are in Christ. And Christ is in us. How do you separate something that is in something else? How do you separate ink from water? How do you separate something that is fused together? And that's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we've read the scripture many, many times. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all, new, all things have become new. See, we do not stand separate from God with all these obstacles, trying to press through and get to God. That's how most people see their faith life. I'm trying to get to God. He says, no, I'm here. I'm living inside you. And you know what? In the spiritual realm, you are in Christ already. He says, you are seated with him in heavenly places, the Bible says. So we have these anchors of truth, and I close with this. God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, called according to his purpose. This is a truth that you can anchor your faith in.
These are things that you put on your wall and you say it over and over. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's found in Jesus. That's a truth that you can anchor your faith in. 2 Timothy 1.12 I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that, that which I have committed to him until that day. That beautiful day when we will see his face. He says, God is able. He is strong enough to keep you in his hand. Don't give up. The final enemy has already been defeated. That's why we can be more than conquerors. The enemy has been conquered. Therefore, we are more than conquerors in Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to receive the communion now. I want you to take your, your elements.